Hello, um, welcome everybody to our show today. Um, welcome. Um, I'm really happy that you are all here to see you. Um, today we are going to talk about IBM Cloud Code Engine, run your source code, containers, and batch, uh, batch, so batch jobs serverless. So I'm really pleased to have Uwe Fasnacht and Simon Moser here with me today. And I'm, <laughs> I'm going to give the word directly to you, uh, Uwe and Simon. Um, you might want to talk a little bit about yourself before you start with this session, and then um, I'm going to mute myself now <laughs> in order for, uh, to give you the stage. Sure. Thank you very much. Can you hear me? Yes, we yeah. can. Great. All right. Thanks. Oh. Oh, no, that was my mistake. I'm sorry. Okay, and it's back. <laughs> <laughs> so my name is Uwe Fasnacht. I work in the, uh, in the IBM Development Lab in Böblingen in Germany. Um, however, right now I'm sitting in my home office in beautiful Tübingen, um, which is quite close to Böblingen, actually. Um, I've been with IBM Cloud for, I don't know, basically since it's been around in 2014 or so, um, and have seen it grow and prosper, which has been an interesting ride. I used to be a developer advocate and then manage a team of developer advocates. And um, I've been moving into product management positions. And right now I'm responsible as the product director for IBM Cloud Code Engine, which we're going to be showing you today. And Simon. Sure. So, hey, everybody. My name is uh, Simon Moser. Um, I'm also uh, an old IBM Cloud guy, basically, um, I, I probably joined around the same time, maybe even on the same day when, when Uber joined, uh, when when Bluemix was not even called Bluemix yet, so which was still called IBM Cloud Operating Environment, I think, was the very first name. Um, anyhow, it's been a long ride since then. Um, I am in recent years, or in the last couple of, well, basically the last year, I am the lead architect for this new service called Code Engine that I will be happily demoing to you in a second and um, showing you what the value proposition of code engineers is and why we think this is really, really the greatest thing since sliced bread. Um, but before we do that, Uwe, let's do the usual kickoff. All right, let's do a quick introduction here. And let me share my screen. Um, and ideally, you should be seeing my slides in full full screen. Is that working? Yes. Ah, cool. Okay. So IBM Cloud Code Engine, the tagline is any workload accelerate, as you'll hopefully see in, in our demos. And we're going to have a lot of slides. I just want to set the stage real quickly. By the way, here you see um, Simon and my contact info as well on the email. So. Uh, without further ado, let's talk about something that you might have heard of. There's this technology out there called Kubernetes. Um, have you heard of it? I bet you have. And Kubernetes is difficult, right? Um, there's this sort of Kubernetes, the complete guide on the left. And we've actually read and worked through the book on the right side, which is sort of illustrating how tough Kubernetes really is, especially for people who want to not just operate, but use Kubernetes as a developer. Because as a developer, you want to sort of deploy your stuff onto Kubernetes, um, your containers, your workloads, your source code. So it's not just us, IBM, but the industry kind of agrees, right? So these are people from around the industry and Kelsey Hightower is someone you've certainly heard of um, from Google. Basically, everyone is saying, you know, Kubernetes is, is hard, right? It's difficult to use. It was never really intended to be something that developers use directly. Right? YAML files, many of you might be familiar with the complexities of deploying stuff um, on Kubernetes. And um, as Kelsey says, we believe and we agree that the next layer sort of of the in the, the, of the layer cake now that Kubernetes has sort of won the container orchestration wars, the next layer on top is where the real value is and, and where things tend to get interested, right? So sort of what do you do on top of Kubernetes? And that's exactly what Code Engine is. This is brand new. Um, so you might not have heard about this. This might be the first time you've heard about it. And it's for people who just want to write and run applications, batch jobs, uh, code. I just want my stuff to run, right? I don't want to learn Kubernetes. I want, I want it as a smart infrastructure underneath that does its thing 
without having me to tell um, it what to do. So what we're going to be showing you is one container-based environment um, for all your workloads. You're only going to be paying for what you actually use. And that means, and that includes, let's assume you deploy a single container. That container is up. It's serving traffic. I don't know. It's a, your personal web page, something like this, right? And then interest veins in the container scales down to zero because there are no more HTTP requests coming in. You stop paying. HTTP requests come back in, we wake the container up for you, you start paying again, right? So you literally only pay for what you use. Um, it's, it's, it's sort of, think of it as a super simple managed hosting experience, and it's designed to let people, especially developers, get back to coding and not worry about what's underneath and what's actually running your code. Another way to think of it is as Kubernetes made easy. We were thinking about using that as our tagline for the product, um, but we actually sort of wanted to this product to be usable by someone who, who doesn't even know what Kubernetes is. And um, I think in the demo we'll be showing you that we're never going to be saying the word Kubernetes because you can use code agent without even knowing what that is. So who have we built this for? Last slide before we'll get into, into actually showing you the product. We've built Code Engine with four people in mind. And the first one is someone who's a container savvy developer. This is someone who's running, um, as some of you might be, running you know, Docker on your laptop. I've got a container. I know what a container image file looks like. I'm, I have that container running on Docker on my laptop. And now I want to sort of magically push that container into the cloud and have it run there. Right? What I do not want to do is I do not want to go to the cloud and instantiate a cluster. And now I own that cluster. Uh, I don't want to size the cluster and worry about the cluster. And do I really use that cluster? I'm going to be paying for that cluster the whole time it's active. Right? I just want to have my containers, one or many, push it to the cloud, only pay for what I use, and not worry about anything underneath. The second persona we've created um, this product for is someone that might not actually think of themselves as a developer, right? This is someone that runs large scale batch jobs, right? Maybe someone that transforms images that are sitting in an object store somewhere that needs to be resized to thumbnails or videos that need to be compressed or, I don't know, Monte Carlo simulations for a portfolio scoring in a bank or DNA sequencing, right? All these things sort of need massively fan out batch jobs where you submit a batch job that fans out into tens, hundreds, thousands, ten thousands of jobs and operates on things in parallel. Once the job is done, it all sort of collapses, goes back down to zero, right? So these are these are people wanting to submit batch jobs to the cloud without understanding how they really run. The next one is sort of a modern developer that is familiar with cloud functions. You might be familiar with AWS Lambda. You might be familiar with Azure cloud functions, Google cloud functions, IBM cloud functions, right? Um, and, and you might love that idea of function as a service, right? I put my function out there in the cloud. It gets triggered by some event. It runs something. It does something. I pay for while it's active. And then it stops doing something again until it gets triggered again. And that is exactly what we're going to do with Code Engine as well, right? So Code Engine will be entering into that space as well, function as a service space, but um, it is going to allow you a much broader type set of workloads to deploy. It's basically going to remove all the limits, right? So in the functions today, you have limits in terms of how many gigabytes you can use. You have limits in terms of how long can your function run for. All of those limits will be removed. And then the last person is a PaaS developer, someone who might be using you know, Heroku, who might be using Cloud Foundry today. I, I have source code. The source code is sitting on my laptop. The source code is sitting in a Git repo somewhere, maybe on GitHub. I don't know what a container is. I don't want to learn what a container is. I don't know what these container images are. I don't know how they get stored. I, I don't know how they get deployed. I, I, I don't know anything like this. The only thing I want to know is here's, here's my source code magically run that source code on the cloud for me, and that's it. Give me a running application. 
right? Do all of this weird stuff like container image creation and packaging and deploying underneath. And I don't want to know about this. So these are the four types of people that we had in mind when we designed Code Engine. But before we talk more about the architecture, what's actually going on, um, I want to hand off to Simon, who is going to show you a demo of the first persona. I have a container, it's running on my laptop, and I want to push that container to the cloud and have it run in the cloud. All right, Simon, I'm going to turn it over to you. All right, so I'm assuming you can hear me now? Yep. Great, so let me sh start sharing my screen and see whether I can, whether it actually starts coming along. So tell me if you can now yep. see my browser. All right, yep. cool. All right, so um, as Uwe just said, um, so what I'm going to do in the next, let's say, half an hour or so is I'm going to show you three types of demos, right? Um, and I'm um, going to walk you through the individual capabilities of the platform as well as of the individual capabilities of, of uh, the, 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 the pieces. And uh, what I suggested we're going to do is that after each demo, we're going to take a quick break and do a little bit of a, a, a Q&A on that specific topic, because like I said, it, it's like three isolated slots. But before I do a lot of talking, let me get into this. So I'm locked into the IBM Cloud um, console, and you've probably seen this, this view before if you have ever been locked into the IBM Cloud. So if I can click on this little menu here, and you'll find an entry here on the left, which is called Code Engine. That's the service that I'm presenting, and that's the, the piece that we're gonna, gonna start working right now. So, um, the the first thing that we're going to do is um, um, is we're going to create a project and um, a project basically I'm going to explain to that in a second what it means but that's going to take a minute or so to be created so I'm going to call it I don't know, meetup demo for for the lack of a better word and I'm just going to create this project and while this is running um, let me let me quickly explain to you what this does right so the first thing that is happening is um, this project is corresponding technically to what we call the Kubernetes namespace. So um, in the back of the in the back end now, what's happening is you think of that we have this giant Kubernetes cluster, and this giant Kubernetes cluster, um, I now get a little bit of a chunk um, of space on that cluster, and that space is becoming um, called Meetup Demo. And you see now 28 seconds later, I have an, an active project that I have called Meetup Demo, and that exists. And for now, we're gonna forget about this again. Um, we're gonna need it later, but right now, what I wanna do is, this is my Docker Hub, right? Well, this is a Docker Hub. So you probably used all Docker Hub, and this is the IBM.com organization inside of Docker Hub. And there's just a bunch of container images that we have stored there. So what I'm going to do is, oops, wrong window. What I'm going to do is um, on this screen here where it says start creating, I'll say, I just want to run my container image. And as you can see here, I'm going to use a hello world image from Docker Hub, right? So once I click on that, um, Code Engine asks me, do you want to run an application or a job? So what's the difference? An application is usually something that I deploy and that serves HTTP requests. A job is something that I deploy and it actually runs to completion. So I'm gonna talk about it a little later and just ignore it for now, right? So the next one is I have to select a project and this is why we created one upfront, which is the meetup demo one. And now I'm gonna say, I'm gonna call, call this application Hello World Meetup. And now it's going to ask me, are you deploying your code from a pre-configured or pre-created container image, or are you deploying it from a piece of source code? And obviously, because I created it from a, from a Docker Hub image, I'm going to pick a um, container image, and I'm going to kick the image reference. And that's all I need. That's all I, I wanted to do. And now I click deploy. Right? And what's happened now is it will take that container image and basically deploy that to the cloud right away, right? Um, as you can see here, um, and it will um, basically be accessible for everybody in this meetup in a second. And I will, once this is ready, I will deploy. I will uh, put the link into the chat of um, of the of the tool here, of the uh, broadcast um, tool, such that everybody can access this application. So while it's deploying, it's just going to, only going to take a couple of seconds. 
while it's deploying, let me talk a little bit about these other things that you saw, which is the runtime and the environment variable. Okay, all right. it's already there, so let me quickly kick it off and you say the application is there, right? So, um, and because I'm, I didn't lie, what, let me tell you the following thing. I can paste that URL to you, right, in the chat. And if you click on this application, um, you can actually access my Hello World application that I just deployed, hello world meetup dot some cryptic namespace and then dot yourself code engine app domain dot cloud. So um, what happens, right? So you can click on it and you would see the same hello world that, that I saw. Um, so what happened um, is um, we just took an image that was pre-configured and we launched it and we didn't specify anything, right? So it's a super easy way from a pre cat container image to a live application in production in, how long did it take? 30 seconds maybe, right? Very, very fast. Like if you have the code done and you have it packaged up as a container, you just take it, you throw it in. The good news about this is it has no um, um, notion that I have been interacting with Kubernetes so far, right? It's totally hey, abstracted away, yes. Can I just interrupt you for a second? Sure. A comment. Could you maybe um, make your screen larger? Because the resolution is tough to see. If you just hit Control Plus a few times. For the browser, you mean? Yeah, yeah, for the browser too. Yeah. Uh, for what else? <laughs> I think <laughs> no. Later on for the CLI, I think it's fine. It's better now. Okay, so I thanks. I, I can, I can, I can. Like, if it's still too small, then uh, please, please start complaining again, and okay. I'll, I'll do it. Okay, so um, so one of the things, and, and what I'm going to ask you to do now is um, maybe quickly stop hitting my application uh, URL, right? Um, um, hitting my application URL because I want to show you something, and as long as you guys are sending traffic to my application, that will, won't happen. So we have to stop the traffic to the application right now, please. So basically, um, if I really wanted to, I could have changed a bunch of parameters, right? In, in this initial screen where I did the deployment, I could have, for example, specified how much memory I want my application to have, how much CPU I want my application to have. Um, and I could also specify two parameters down here, which are called scaling. And the scaling parameters are the ones that basically say, um, if you if I'm receiving no traffic, like if my application is receiving no traffic, should I even run an instance of it, or should I really scale it down to zero and thereby reduce the cost as maximum as somehow possible? On the other hand, if I'm receiving really, 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 really a lot of traffic, how much, how many applications do you want me to scale up max? And remember that eventually you will be paying for the number of applications. Right, so if you if you put an infinite number here, your bill might become infinite. If you only put ten, you'll say, okay, I'm going to pay ten times what the number of one application will cost. So you can influence the scaling. And right now, let me refresh this. If you guys were were following my instructions, oh, you, you quickly maybe saw it up here. Um, it was scaled down to zero instances um, for a second, and then it, it jumped back to one. So someone might have sent a request again. But what I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna change the number of instances to one, right? Because I want always one application I want always to be running. So I'm gonna click save and deploy. And now the fun part happens, right? Because what happens now is you, you see that um, it, it created what is called a new revision, okay? And a new revision means because I now changed a, a, a property of that application, which is just, I said scaling, minimum scaling equals one instead of minimum scaling equals zero, that created a new version of my application, right? And if I go down here to my revision and traffic, you can now see I have two instances of my application. I have the, the first one, which was created five minutes ago, hello world meetup, blah, blah, something. And I have a second one, which is hello world meetup 99 something else. And that one was created 46 seconds ago and it's the one that is currently active because it receives 100% of the traffic, as you can see here. 
one of the things that we will be able to do in the very not so distant future is to be able to influence that traffic, right? So for example, you could I could say, I want 50% of the traffic go to the old instance and 50% of the traffic to the new instance. And that is super useful if you want to test out new features, right? So for example, you introduce a new shopping cart in your application and you want to do some user testing, but you don't want to Every, you don't want all users to move over to the new shopping cart. You basically would do a traffic split and you would say, hey, 90% of the traffic goes to my old application, but 10% of the users, they should get the new shopping cart and see if they like it. And you know, you could do these kind of testings. And again, all of that happens without you knowing anything about Kubernetes or anything along those lines. So, um, let me do go back to the slides now and uh, do give you guys a little bit of a uh, this. Oops, sorry. So this this was a demo. So I'm going to do this talk, and then before we move on to the next one, um, we're going to do a little Q and A. So what did you just see? Right. What you just saw was a demonstration of a Hello World demo of running a container image of onto code engine. And on the left side, you see these four entry points into the system, right? A container image, a batch job, an application or functions. And those four um, um, channels into the system, we just showed the container one. So what happened under the covers is this container image was provided to a, a open source technology called Knative. That's the one that we run. And Canadif was then doing a little bit of work for us, for example, the auto scaling capabilities and all that stuff, and then created a Kubernetes deployment and deployed that on our huge, gigantic Kubernetes cluster that we run in the backend. Right? Nothing that you care for at all because you just deployed your container, some magic happened in the background, it's running on Kubernetes, and life is good. All of the routing aspects, like the stuff that we like that you can access it through HTTPS, right? That you can do the traffic shaping, that is responded uh, responsible uh, of the responsibility of Istio, which is the second component that we have uh, as part of the of the code engine architecture. And then once I'm going to go into the next um, and in the next demo, where we are going to talk about, for example, what what happens if you only deploy your source code. There will be other technologies coming in like Tecton, like Paquito, like Shipwright, which are building blocks, internal building blocks for us that we use in order to give you that user experience that we inspire. Um, but from, from that point on, I think what I want to do right now is um, quickly take a stop here, a little break, um, and open up the floor for the first round of questions um, a, a couple of minutes and see if there are any that you already that you already have burning under the, your nails and need, need to be answered. So I'm not sure if you guys can speak, but um, uh, if you can maybe ask your question in the chat and I can read it out and, and um, I can maybe answer it if there are questions. I'm just allowing a, a minute or so for someone to ask questions. Um, and if there's really no questions, then I just just move on. But typing takes a little if you guys cannot speak up. Ah, the difference to OpenShift, Simon. What's the difference to OpenShift? So maybe I can, we can talk about this um, while others are typing. I can answer that question. Mm -hmm. um, sure, go ahead. Question come up. Hey, what is the difference with OpenShift? There's quite a big difference here. OpenShift is something where you own the cluster, right? You take OpenShift, you then deploy OpenShift. Either you install it on your hardware, maybe in your data center, or you run OpenShift, of course, in a cloud like the IBM cloud. But before you do that, you have to make decisions like how large do I want that OpenShift cluster to be, right? So you have to size the cluster. Of course, you can grow and shrink it afterwards. But that's one difference. Here, you, with what we've shown you, you have to make no assumptions about size, right? If you have extremely bursty workloads, code engine, it will scale up basically infinitely. 
versus OpenShift, which you sort of have to scale either manually or semi-automatically. The other big, big difference is that with OpenShift, you have to manage it, right? You own OpenShift. You own the, the upgrade path. You own the security. You own the cluster. That has advantages. It's your own cluster, right, with the isolation that comes with it. And that has all the disadvantages I just talked about. And of course, the price difference is, is, is radical, right? I mean, obviously, having an OpenShift deployment is going to be orders of magnitude more expensive than deploying something on code engine, right? So I think if you need, if you, if you A, have the skills for OpenShift um, and, and for Kubernetes, right? Because OpenShift obviously is packaged Kubernetes. If you B, want to be in the business of running, securing, administering your own cluster and C, if you maybe need the isolation capabilities, or D, if you maybe want to have to run things on premises in your own data center, right? Those would all be pros and cons of OpenShift. One last thing around OpenShift is in the future, right? This is further out. In the future, Code Engine is going to be able to deploy workloads onto OpenShift clusters. This is still, you know, roughly a year away. This is something that we're working on. So as you, as Simon was play, deploying the whole world um, container, what you saw, and he sort of skipped over it, is he deployed that in Dallas, uh, in our Dallas data center in the cloud. Mm -hmm. In the future, some time away, you would be able to choose an OpenShift cluster, right? That might be on-prem or that might be in the cloud to be the target of that deployment. So in that sense, you could see Code Engine as a developer experience that would allow you to deploy things currently in this multi-tenant cluster in the cloud, but in the future onto OpenShift clusters as well, right? So that's sort of, um, I hope that answered the question around OpenShift else keep asking. And then there was a second question, which is um, IBM Cloud Engine comes up with Istio and Knative deployment or customer has to have his own installation. So, so I mean, I think Uwe answered this. So Code Engine is a cloud service. You have to install nothing nowhere, right? All that you have to do is you have to bring up your browser like I did. You have to go to cloud.ibm.com, go to the Code Engine page and then start working, right? No installation, no nothing. Um, um, and and that's that's all that there is, right? And and right now, as Uwe said, you cannot you cannot control anything other than the deployment target. Like you can we can you can only deploy to let's say yourself as a cloud region. Tomorrow you will be able to deploy that workload that you just created onto an OpenShift cluster that's running in the cloud or on prem or something else. Right? But right now that's not possible. You will be deploying into our gigantic Kubernetes cluster that we run and manage for you. Um, and you don't, in theory, you, you shouldn't even know about that we do it now. Okay, cool. Um, so um, I'm not seeing any more questions, I think. Um, so let me then move on to the next part of the demo. Uh, actually, no, I'm gonna do a little bit of slides first. So kick it again. So that's that's the architecture as we have have been discussing. But but let's uh, dissect the, that architecture a little bit, right? So if we're not taking away all of the stuff because we're going to focus on the second use case. And the second use case is, hey, I don't know what I I, I don't have a Docker image. I, all I have is a GitHub repository. Like I I don't I don't know what a Docker image is, and I don't care what a Docker image is. But hey, here's my code, and it's stored in this GitHub over there. So that is the application use case here on the left. And let's quickly talk about what everybody thinks is happening, right? What I just showed is, hey, I have a container and I'm just going to push this to the cloud. Well, in reality, that's not what happened, right? That's what I made it look like. But in reality, that's not what happened. What happened is that there was a point in time where I pushed a container to my image registry, right? And in this case, the image registry that I have been using was Docker Hub. And now when I said, hey, deploy me this image, the runtime pulled this <coughs> image out of the image registry and deployed it on the Kubernetes cluster, right? So the image registry takes a central role. I mean, right now we didn't even we didn't even talk about it, but the, the image registry is an important piece, right? Because someone needs to push that image through the registry. And once it is in the registry, then the Kubernetes cluster can pull it from the registry and deploy it from there, right? So when you have source code as an input, 
someone will need to build this container image for you, right? Because without the container image, we cannot run. Um, however, you as a developer, you shouldn't really care about building container images. That's at least my opinion, right? Um, a developer should focus on writing code and not on building images, right? It's an, right now, it's unfortunately a necessary evil, but that's not the right answer to the problem. And creating a good and a secure container image can actually be complicated and time consuming because all, all you know that um, that building uh, an image is you know can have security vulnerabilities and all sorts of problems that come along with it. So there is this magic process, and OpenShift calls the source to image. Um, we are calling it built, and, and that magic process basically takes I don't know something like a batch job, an application, or a function and creates an image out of that. And it does that by applying um, you know, specific recipes. So for an application, we assume that the code has a web server for a function, we inject the web server and so on and so forth. So that build process is a little bit of magic and you shouldn't really care about it. You should just have to know that it exists and it's there. So let me deploy how that actually, uh, sorry, let me demo how that actually works in, in real life. So the first thing that I have to do now is when I build an application, I need to store my image somewhere. And because I don't want to use Docker Hub as my storage location, I'm just going to do and create, a, or going to use an IBM code, uh, sorry, an IBM cloud container registry that I have created up front. So if I go to my meetup demo project, I can specify something which is called the registry access here, right? And the registry access, I'm going to call, my, I'm going to give my registry a name. I'm going to call it meetup registry. Oops. And it is in us.icr.io. And now I have uh, to provide some kind of a password that I'm not going to show you, of course. And a username um, that I need. Oops. That IPM.com. And I'm going to add a registry to my project just because I need a storage location for this project where I'm going to store my images. So um, let me quickly go back to my project. And now let's do the second thing, right? So um, that code that I just deployed as a container image, that code is also available here as on my GitHub. So you see here, this is IBM Code Engine repository. It has a hello world example. And I can look at my source code and that little ASCII piece of code looks familiar, right? So this is my Hello Code Engine um, work. And that's the code that I deployed earlier by through a prepackaged container image. Right now, I'm going to deploy it through a build process. So what I'm going to do now next is I'm going to go start here and I say, hey, I would like to run my source code, right? And it's, again, an application because it serves HTTP traffic. I want to do it in the meetup demo, and I'm going to use code engine uh, um, meetup from source. Right, that's the name of of my of my application, code engine meetup from source code, and I'm going to do it from source code. And um, the source code repository, with the GitHub repository that I would like to deploy, is code engine IBM Com. So there's a tiny little thing that I would like to quickly go through. So in theory, I could deploy now, but I don't want to because I want to specify something on the build details, right? So the first one is um, I can provide a context directory, and I would like to use a context directory which is called Hello World because my GitHub repository is called Hello World, right? So I'm going to use that one. I'm going to use the master, master branch of my GitHub, and it's going to be my source code of code engine. The next thing that I'm going to do is um, it asks me what a build strategy is. And I'm going to explain that in a second while the build is running. Um, so right now, I'm just picking Cloud Native Build Pack, and I'm picking a super large machine. right? Um, and I'm going to explain that why I did that. And then last but not least, it asks me where should I store the output of the thing. So I'm going to, to, I'm going to put use my meetup registry. I'm going to pick. Um, a namespace inside of this registry and um, repository inside of this registry. And that's basically it, right? That's all that I needed. And then I'm going to do a done. And now I have, and now I could again set some runtime settings like vCPU and all other pieces. And I'm just going to deploy that whole thing. 
So um, while this is deploying, it's doing two things. The first thing that right now it's doing, it's creating a build. And the second thing it's doing, it's is creating, um, uh, deploying the application then once it's ready. So let's quickly double check here. So if I go to my project again, right, I can go to builds, image builds. And as you can see, hey, I have an image built, right? This is the one that I just kicked off 28 seconds ago. It's an image build for this image that I've just been using. And now I can do something funky and I can say, hey, let me take a look at my registry here in IBM Cloud. Um, and I am going to go to the, oops, this is taking slow as most of you yourself. And um, I think I just created this guy, All right? Is that true? Hello from source. Oh, uh, no, that's not the right one. Oh, this, I think it's this one, right? So, so this is this is the the image that I that I am just creating or updating in this case because I created it before, um, and you can see it in my image registry, so you can take a look at at my image. Um, I should have created a, an empty namespace because that's a little bit confusing now, so I apologize for that. I, I should have created an empty namespace and just deployed it into the empty namespace rather than existing using an existing one. But hopefully, you believe me that my image that I just created gets inserted into this um, into this registry. And then you can actually see how the security status of this image is, et cetera, et cetera. So with that being said, let's move back to my application. Um, and whoops, by now the application is ready, right? Code engine meetup from source. I can click on the application URL. Oops, something happened. And it's, it's as hell world, right? So that's exactly the, the application that I wanted to have. And so that you do believe me, I can also put the link here and you can actually see that it's um, a Hello World application that has been created from source. So, um, right. So the next thing that I'm gonna do is I'm gonna quickly explain to you about what the source to image technology is. So you might have wondered why did Simon pick this build pack thing and, and what is this build pack thing in the first place, right? So think about you have a Git repository and in this Git repository, you might store all kinds of things, right? And in the one case, you might say, hey, I have a Docker file already in my Git repository because this Docker, this, in Docker, this repository describes a complete Docker, Dockerized application, a complete containerized application. And all that you want to do now is you want to do a Docker build, so to speak, and deploy the result onto a cluster. The other option would be you don't have a Docker file and you don't care what a Docker file is and you don't even know what a Docker file is, right? You just have a piece of source code. And what the build strategy allows you to do is to tell the system which, is, which one is the case. Like if you are running a Docker file, um, it will just take whatever is in the Docker file and build that for you and be done with it. If you are using a build pack, um, what it will do is it will analyze the source code. So in my case, going back to my application here, right? In my case, this is a Go file, right? So it would analyze the source code. It would find out, hey, this is a Golang application. Then it would pick the language specific builder, in this case, a Golang runtime. And then it would start the build um, with the Golang and it would package everything it needs into your container image, right? So it would say, I have a source code, I have a Golang library, I have the binary of my application, and it would package all of that into the image and then store the image into the registry and then deploy it from the registry. Okay, so with that said, let's quickly do the second round of questions here. Um, I lost, where am I? Second round of questions, um, if there are any for um, this part of the demo now. Again, I'm giving you another another minute or so to type questions, if you have any. Yeah, because of the screen fuzziness, Simon, we had a little bit of difficulty reading source code and stuff like that. So I pasted in the GitHub repo um, that people can look at themselves and sort of get the instructions on how to get this going. Uh, I apologize. I did, yeah, uh, I don't know what to do about this, honestly. I... Yeah, no, it's, it's crowdcast. <laughs> I don't think it's on your side. Okay. 
Okay, so can one see somewhere the creative container? Uh, ah, yes, um, but I'm gonna, I will, I will put the table on towards the end. Uh, sorry, I'll put the answer to that question after demo three because I'm gonna go there and then and then uh, and then you'll get it. So I, I apologize, but I won't answer this right now. But I will answer this after the third demo. Any more questions? What testing. about testing? Oh, that's a good one. Okay. Um, so so far, um, we are not allowing that. So um, the point is. Under the covers, we're running a CI/CD pipeline behind the build, obviously, right? Um, however, one of the things where I don't want to get as code engine is into the business of uh, being becoming a pipeline tool. That's that's not what we want. We're not a pipeline tool, right? So what you could do is you could have um, um, a CI/CD pipeline sitting in front of it and then just deploy it um, into code engine. And then, of course, you could do all kinds of um, testing and vulnerability checking and God knows what else. Um, um, but right now, if you, we want to really be simple here. We, here's your code. You just push it into the into the code engine um, runtime and, and let it run. Um, and if you want, um, you could put an a IBM toolchain service in front of it and do all the testing and all the pipelining work uh, that you want to do from there. But that's not a functionality that we are particularly interested in in implementing inside of code engine right so you can basically think of um if you have a complex you know orchestration cd pipeline ci cd pipeline you would all the tests do all the tests as you usually would and you can think of code engine sort of being the last deployment step in that pipeline right and of course in ibm cloud we have a sort of a pipeline as a service um, um, service <laughs> in the cloud, but you, you might be doing something on-prem, right? Where you're doing all your CI, CD pipelining and your testing and stuff like that. And then the last command would be, hey, deploy this to code engine. And Simon hasn't shown this yet much that you actually, of course, have a CLI as well, not just the user interface, the graphic user interface that you can see. That's a perfect segue into <laughs> perfect segue into the next uh, part of the session because I'm actually going to show the CLI in a second. So okay. Uh, uh, maybe, oh, okay. Okay. So I, I, yeah, I see. Um, Matt, can, can we? Um, can I also table that towards the end? Yeah, because that's coming. Um, well. We're gonna do this in at the in, 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 like leave the question open, and we're gonna answer it towards the end. Okay, so now um, I showed you how to deploy a container image directly. I showed you how to deploy source code. Um, so let's move ahead and uh, talk a little bit about what is um, what we can also do with batch capabilities. So first and foremost, what are batch capabilities when I talk about this, right? So batch capabilities basically say, hey, I can run massively parallel computations on IBM Cloud. And what does that mean? What does massively parallel computations mean? Right. So very often you have the case where you say, OK, I have this object store bucket and in this object store bucket. I have one million images. Right. Or I have the satellite data and I have a lot of images or I have something else, some sensor data that I received from some sensors and I have a lot of them. And now what I would like to do is I would like to process that data, everything in the same way. Right. So for the images, I might have to crop. I might want to crop and sharpen them. For the sensor data, I might might apply some kind of function to the data and store the output to some other place. Right. So it's these heavy compute tasks um, that you would like to run, and you would like to run them massively in parallel. So if you have one million images, ideally you would like to run one million containers in parallel, such that you get the data processed very quickly. Right. Um, some other use cases would be like map reduce kind of things, scientific simulations, rendering of images for a 3D movie, right? Um, ETL workloads like data uh, transcoding, all of that stuff is usually done by batches. <clears throat> and one of the benefits um, of a service like Code Engine, even over things like, like OpenShift, is you basically have infinite capacity, right? Um, you can run very heavy computation jobs um, in a massively parallel fashion um, on the service. And all that you have to do is you're providing a job definition 
a reference to the container image that has the code that you would like to run and what command to execute. And then you can specify a bunch of parameters, for example, like a retry and, and that's it. And code engine will then run the, these jobs in an array of parallel instances with almost no limits. So if your container uses 16 CPUs and two gigabytes, uh, 20 gigabytes of memory, and you run a thousand of them in parallel, then we would try to run a thousand of them in parallel, right? Um, each instance is a separate container based on that image and automatically retry, uh, we will automatically retry the failed containers or code engine will automatically retry the failed containers. So this is a little bit trickier to demo. Uh, I'm going to try it anyhow, because I would like to show you a couple of more things. So the first one is this, right? So I'm not sure if you can see my screen now. I'm hoping that you can. Yeah, uh, you might want to make it a bit larger. A bit larger. Hit Controller Plus a few times, yeah, yeah. Because it's okay. going to be very difficult to read the CLI because of the blurring. Maybe even larger, Simon. Even the, larger. We, need the font, we need the font to be larger. Uh, how can I do this? I mean, this. Yeah, like yeah, this? yeah, yeah. Keep going. Keep going. <laughs> <laughs> ah, there we go. Okay, this is looking better. Thanks. Okay, it's all. It's so big I can't read it anymore. On my phone now. <laughs> <laughs> but we can. <laughs> okay, let me do the following. Uh, is, oh Jesus. Okay, hold on. Um, because I, I need to be able to read it somehow too. Okay. Because uh, <laughs> otherwise I don't know what I'm typing. All right. Okay, cool. So um got it. So before I go so I'm logged into my IBM Cloud account. It's the same account that I have been using. And in order to prove that that you guys um um that I'm gonna do this, I'm gonna say IBM Cloud Code Engine Project List. Right. And as everybody would expect, I'm going to get going to find a project which is called Meetup Demo. Right. So um, I'm going to project now I'm going to select the project Meetup Demo and the name is uh, Meetup Demo. Right. So this is the project select command and the project select command just basically says, OK, I'm now targeting this project because I want with this with the command line, I would like to work into this project. Um, I can now, let's for example, say, um, list me the apps that I have in my project, right? And um, obviously, we're going to find two apps because we deployed one from the source code, right? That's this one. And then we deployed one through the container image, which is called Hello World. And those are the, the active, the, the active uh, projects, uh, sorry, the active applications that I'm having. And of course, I can also so hey, show me my jobs. So the jobs are my, my batch jobs, and I don't have a batch job at, at this point in time, and I probably did something wrong. Oh, <laughs> of course, it should be like this. I just typed, and it says, hey, I have no jobs yet. All right, cool. So let's do the following. Let's create a job then, and I'm going to do this in the in the in the CLI, and then I'm going to flip over back to the UI, right? So what I'm going to do is um, I am going to do um, IBM Code Engine job create. So I'm going to create a job. I'm going to use an image. And the image is called IBM.com first job. So that's, again, an image that sits out there on Docker Hub. I could have put Docker docker.io slash IBM.com here as well. And I'm going to give it a name. And that name is a meetup job. Oh. All right, cool. So now I created a job called Meetup Job, um, and that job first and foremost does nothing. It just has it just is just an empty shell, so to speak. But when I would like to run this job, so I basically say, hey, I would like to run the code inside of this image, right? I'm going to create something <clears throat> that I call um, a job run, right? So I'm going to say, um, and that's not correct. So I'm gonna do like this. Hopefully you guys can sort of see this, right? So I'm gonna say IBM Cloud Code Engine submitted job run. The job that I would like to run is, is called meetup job. And I'm gonna specify something which is called array indices. And that means one to 100. And that exactly means I will be running 100 parallel instances of that job. So, let me do the following quickly before I hit submit. I'm going to move over to 
my job table here, right? And it, you can actually see that I have the meetup job. That's the one that I just created. But now when I submit it through the UI, it's be very quick. So I'm, I'm going to submit it. And what will happen now is you will see uh, that a meetup job is running. And you can see that 90, 90 of these jobs have already been completed. And that's now even 100. So I, I, I was almost not fast enough to, to, to spin over. But this job now has been, um, this container has been running 100, 100 containers in parallel. And each of the containers did something. It basically took the index parameter, so whether I'm container one or whether I'm container 100, and it just printed it out to stand it out. So it's kind of like a stupid job. But if you click on this page, <clears throat> if everything works fine, so that's the, that's the tricky part now, that, that doesn't really 100% work all the time. Oh, OK, so it doesn't. Let me run it again, and uh, because I do it this post factum. So I'm going to run my meetup job again. Um, and I will, uh, oops, let me see here. So I'm going to have a second one. See this one? That's almost completed. And as you can see here now in the logging, um, in my logging integration that I show, you can actually see that, that this is all, all true and all real, right? So I created 100 parallel containers. And everybody, every container is just executing what it's supposed to do. So it says, hi from my batch job, my index is 3. Hi from my batch job, my index is 60. So it doesn't give you a guarantee about the ordering. So it will not run 1 to 100 in, in the, the same order, but it will run 100 of them in parallel. And whoever gets scheduled first and whoever gets um, executed first will just produce this log line. So you can actually see that um, by arbitrary numbers, um, these 100 jobs have been uh, run, and these 100 jobs have been printing out their standard out message. Um, into our log view here. So let me flip back um, to, oh yes, and now, now I'm going to answer the, the final question that was about um, um, can I actually see the containers that I have been creating? So <clears throat> remember in the beginning when I said we are we're showing Kubernetes or we're using Kubernetes, but we don't want or don't need you to know what Kubernetes is, right? That is what we're going to do. Um, so what you can do is remember that I did the, the IBM Cloud CE project select. And what you can do is you can pass a parameter that is called minus K. So let me just do that quickly. And if you do that, um, I will target this project for, for my kubectl command line. So with that, I can now go and I can say, without having a Kubernetes cluster, I do not own a Kubernetes cluster, right? And there is a Kubernetes cluster somewhere in the background, but I don't, I don't care about this. But I can now say kubectl get pods and every kubectl command um, that you could that you can run, and the kubectl get pods will actually now show you what's running on your Kubernetes cluster, right? So um, surprisingly, we have 99 um, job run containers, right? And they all completed, as you can see here. And then we are going to have two regular containers. Um, the first one from the source build, and that's that's run. And then the Hello World one that we deployed earlier that is already running or still running, right? So can I see my containers? Yes, I absolutely can. If you, if you want to, um, don't, do I have to see my containers? Absolutely not. Like, ideally, I don't want you to use kubectl. If you have to use kubectl for something, I'm not doing my job right. right? Um, but if you are nerdy enough, if you really want to use kubectl in order to look into your containers or look at logs or, I don't know, whatever it is that you want to do, you have the technical ability to do so. All right, so final slide. So that was the demo. I showed you that <clears throat> the final slide before handing back to Uwe. So um, the this is just a, a wrap up of what I just showed in the last demo again, right? So I created a job definition that had an image and a command and a race back, which oops, which was a, the the number of how many how many instances I would like to run and stuff like how many CPU and memory I would like to run for each of those. I submitted. <clears throat> Then there is this fan out mechanism where 
you know, let's say if you create a hundred containers, um, you get a hundred parallel instances, ideally, of this job, and every instance gets a parameter passed in. And <clears throat> in a real world use case, <clears throat> if you're now not doing something like a hello world, in the real world use case, you would use this parameter to actually get some data. Like, for example, think about you would use this parameter to pull all the images that start with the letter A or I don't know, something like that. Like if, if you are indexed zero, you pull all the images that start with the letter A. Or you know, so, like you can think of whatever is suitable in your concrete use case, um, but that, that's how the mechanism, how it works. It will pass these instance parameters. You can then use these instance parameters to pull whatever data you want and do something with it. And thereby you achieve massive parallel computation um, at very low time. And with that being said, I think I'm at the end of my three demos. We have five minutes left. So Uwe, I think I ran a little bit over and you have to hurry up. So apologies for that. Not a problem. I think the demos are more important if you just stop sharing. So yes, I, I will do that. Sharing. Yes. So, and let me share my screen. All right, you should be seeing a slide again. Yes, we do. Oh, all right. So what have you just seen? <laughs> You've seen a multi-tenant container platform in the cloud that is Kubernetes based, but that hides Kubernetes from those who want, do not want to see it, right? So think of it as Kubernetes is native as a service. You can deploy almost any type of container based workload, right? Basically anything that fits into a container, you can deploy it on code engine. If you don't have a container, We'll build one for you, as Simon has shown, right? Bring in the source code, we'll build the container and deploy it. It scales. You've seen it scale down to zero, at which time you'll stop paying. And it scales amazingly high for jobs, for workloads, for high performance workloads. Code Engine comes batteries included, right? So monitoring, logging, service mesh, all that stuff's built in. You've seen sort of, well, we've, we've shown you only a glimpse of it, serverless workloads, right? You've never had provision servers, you had to worry about the servers, you had to somehow um, roll out infrastructure before you could use code engine. It's all hidden underneath the cover, so serverless in that sense. It uses open source project, Kubernetes, Paketo, Shipwright, um, Istio, Knative, and so forth and so on, uh, Tecton, right? So there is no sort of proprietary lock-in. It just bundles all of these technologies into something that you can use extremely easily. And you can deploy different types of workloads, right? And that is different from some of the other cloud platforms, the competitors out there. You can deploy containers, application, batch jobs, functions. No matter which, they will all sort of land on the same Kubernetes cluster and run on the same platform, which makes it very easily easy for you to sort of combine them and have communications between these various containers, right, that are private and do not run over the internet. Um, Multi-tenant shared container service, and as I said, there's going to be sort of an outlook that you're going to be able to deploy this um, into single clusters, into your own cluster like OpenShift in the future. So this is sort of our design thinking mantra. A developer can deploy almost any type of workload without worrying about any of the crap underneath, right? You, We've gotten you an HTTPS certificate. You didn't even see that, right? We ordered that under the covers. You've never seen VMs or there was no networking. You didn't have to worry about weird Kubernetes things like ingress uh, controllers and stuff like that. We didn't write any YAML files. You only pay for when your container is active. So you can think of this as sort of serverless 2.0, right? It's what serverless used to be, but we take away basically all of the limits, right? And that allows you to deploy workloads either interactive with a route, like a hello world web servers that we showed, or run to completion workloads, right? Functions as a service, batch jobs as a service, right? And you either bring your container or we built the container for you. And that allows sort of a deployment of a wide variety of, of workloads on this platform. Uh, the best thing is you can try this out completely free. We are in tech preview, which uh, we at IBM call it beta, right? We're in tech preview right now. Um, 
Google Code Engine, click on the link. The first one is the one to register on the IBM Cloud. Get yourself a free IBM Cloud account. Um, go head on over to Code Engine, and basically everything that Simon has showed you, um, you can just try this out by yourself. Into the chat, I've dropped a few links to our documentation. I've dropped the link to the Hello World GitHub repo where you can try this out. And with that, maybe we have like one more minute left um, to just stop the screen sharing. One more minute left to um, maybe answer the question. Yeah, so in the meantime, while you were talking, um, Uwe, I have been answering uh, a couple of questions in, in the chat or in the Q&A section. So there was one question from Matt. Um, he said, how easy would it be to migrate IBM Cloud Functions to Code Engine? And I, I answered it. I'm just going to repeat it here quickly verbally. Um, so if you're using your container, if you're using Cloud Functions today with a, with a self-built container image, Matt, um, it's easy. You can already do that, right? You can basically take it take it and throw it into code engine and it would just work. If you are using um, just a function and you're expecting the service to add the web server to it and deploy that for you, that is still work that's that's still happening. And we are looking at that at sometime next year um, in order to be able to support that use case, um, such that we have functional parity, um, but you can safely um, continue to use Cloud Functions for that use case um, in the meantime, because both services will coexist for the moment. So I'm hoping that that answered the question. Okay, and then, uh, oh yes, and then there was a second question, which was, I think Uwe, you answered already, is it possible to trigger these uh, things like jobs or functions from a cost event? And the answer is clearly yes, you can you can already do that. Um, so if you want to kick off a batch job based on a you know based on someone adding a um, an image to your S3 bucket or to your cost bucket, that that is already possible. And Uwe kindly link the piece in the documentation on how, how to do this. Um, so th we're going to work a little bit on improving the, the usability for that. That's that's not final. Um, but if you want to be an early adopter of this stuff, you can already go ahead and do that today. OK. And that's all questions that were in the chat. Thank you so much. Simon, Uwe, uh, for this really, um, really great talk. Um, I think uh, we all just learned so much <laughs> again. And um, for everyone else, thank you so much. We are a little uh, bit over the time. And um, I want to say thank you that you are, you were here. And I want to um, tell everyone, um, if you don't know about our meetup group, just you know, take the time and um, and join our meetup group in order to uh, be aware of even more um, events coming up. So we have a lot of uh, events coming up in Q4, like in November and December. And um, there will also be a, a lot of stuff going on here in Crowdcast. So I'm looking forward to see you again. Thank you so much. Um, Uwe, Simon, thank you so much for being here today. And um, I really hope we, we are going to see you again next year. <laughs> Sure, we'd love to give you an update how things are progressing with Code Engine. Yes. See you yeah, all we are, again. We are really eager to hear, so <laughs> um, please let us know. Um, yeah, uh, I, I think Miriam posted uh, the link to the meetup group in the chat. Uh, thank you, Miriam. So um, yeah, don't hesitate to join us to, uh, to and visit us on more events. And I'm going to say goodbye for today and going to close the stream right now. Bye, everyone. Bye. Thanks.